Um, so firstly, um, I apologize in advance for that incredibly um, awkward bio. Uh, I'm so, so privileged to be here. Um, I think more important than all that stuff, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, my history for a sec, but is that I spent 33 years working in and around the nonprofit sector. I've sat as a board member, as an executive director, as a fundraiser, as a programmer, um, as and, and and as a charity lawyer. So um, while all those things seem fancy, um, really my heart, my passion is here in the sector. And, and, and for a second, you know, I'll tell you why. And that's because my family fled difficult circumstances in East Africa, um, oh, 1970s. So, you know, 45, 50 years ago. Um, and um, my parents came to the UK where I am right now, just for this week as Keela is opening a, an office here. And, um, and they were supported and empowered by civil society, by nonprofits, by scholarships, by all these things. And so when I was born with an incredibly blessed life, um, my parents instilled in me from literally the age of three, you give back to community, you build civil society, you make the world a better place because we wouldn't be here because of that. And that's why I'm so proud to serve the sector every single day and so excited to be talking about young people today because they are the future of not only our economy, but, but a strong and vibrant nonprofit sector. Um, I'm seeing something that there's an issue with the screen. Um, so I see, I see everything fine. Um, slides. Okay. Perfect. Great. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, a quick introduction that doesn't involve mentioning the queen. Um, my name is Najid Kassam. I'm a husband, a proud Canadian, a recovering corporate lawyer, and a father to a young two and a half year old prince. Um, when I'm not presenting to an amazing group of people that I cannot see, um, I serve as this chief executive officer and founder of Kila, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. It's a powerful and affordable nonprofit management software that helps nonprofits raise more money, do more good. It's helping organizations all around the world transforming how they fundraise and doing it with fundraisers at their very core. Um, at nights and on the weekends, I'm a dad, but I also serve on a, a multitude of boards, including N10, the Better Canada Institute, um, and, and a, a few others that I can't remember. Uh, most importantly, I am, as I mentioned before, deeply committed to strengthening civil society and our sector. Um, today's presentation uh, will actually have four main components. Um, first, I'm gonna explain what the transfer of wealth is and why it's occurring and who will be its main beneficiaries. Next, I'm gonna suggest a few ways for all of us in the sector, especially as fundraisers, to prepare for this transfer, to understand the data points around it. Um, I think every nonprofit can, 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 or really every fundraiser, I think is a better way to put it, can prepare in kind of three core ways. The first one is engaging young people through youth councils and peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, which I'll talk about. Secondly, it's building stronger connections with major donors, but also major donor families. And this is really key. And last and certainly not least, optimizing planned giving. And just today, I want to give you a few takeaways for all of these little things. And when I talk about these strategies, I'm going to weave in examples, hopefully some best practices that I've used that our incredible community of fundraisers and fundraising consultants has shared with me with the hopes that all of you take a pen and paper. Maybe I'm old school, but uh, some notes or whatever it might be and actually get to work tomorrow morning and thinking about these things, especially as we prepare for the oh so important giving season that is upon us. Finally, um, the lovely and wonderful Kim is here, at least somewhere uh, in this ethos of the internet, and she will help us with some Q&As that I'm happy to dig into at the end of this. Without further ado, let's get going. Oh, I forgot about our learning outcomes. Excuse me, I forgot this slide. So as I mentioned, like this is, today's Wednesday, right? I hope it's Wednesday. I think it's Wednesday. So today's Wednesday, by tomorrow or tonight, I want your minds to be buzzing. I want you all to feel excited and empowered. And I want everyone here to walk away with at least a cursory and even maybe a comprehensive understanding of the wealth transfer, what's happening, why it's happening, and how it could potentially impact philanthropy. I also want to unpack strategies, techniques, tools you'll need to make stronger connections with your donors and prepare for the future. Now, 
Let's all take a second and give a big round of applause to the people who will be funding the wealth transfer, the baby boomers. I don't want to forget during this session to celebrate the great work they have done to the nonprofit sector and the support they've given, the generosity they have shown because of boomers, because of all of you, some of whom I'm sure are boomers still working and passionately advocating for the sector, the nonprofit sector, our sector, 10% of the US economy, don't forget that, has become more sensitive to the needs of marginalized communities and much more impactful. It has changed our environment, the way we see human rights and so much more. And speaking for myself, having spent you know, decades in the sector, our sector has become a more vibrant and fulfilling place to work. So thank you to the boomers. And now a little tongue in cheek joke to all of the Gen Xers. Once again, we will completely ignore you, but this is natural, right? As the middle children of history, jokes aside, I want all the Gen Xers to know I see you, I feel you, and I will now ignore you. So let's dive in. Now, you're gonna hear me talking a lot about data because I'm a little obsessed with it. My wife thinks too much, but to really, really, really understand this, let's dig into the data, let's look at it. In 2014, a study conducted by Boston College researchers predicted and I'm not getting this wrong because I have a note on this, that 58 trillion with a T dollars, $58 trillion will transfer from one generation to the next by 2061. So in the next 35-ish years, almost 40 years, we will see $58 trillion change hands. And there'll be three core beneficiaries. The first, will be the heirs of baby boomer. So children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, uncles, aunts, maybe not so, but you know what I mean. The second is nonprofits, especially in charitable bequests. And thirdly, the governments, who will inherit an absurd amount of, inherit, I guess you could call it that, inherit an absurd amount of money through, through incredible amounts of estate taxes. Now, looking at the graph in front of you, we can see that millennials and Gen Zers, Gen Zs, I'm Canadian, I say Z, many of you are American, y'all say Z, whatever you call them, these Gen Zs are likely to receive a significant amount of this transfer, kind of skipping over a lot of millennials. Keeping this in mind, we need to understand how they're different from their parents in order to align our strategies as fundraisers with their values and interests. But millennials are not going to be ignored, so I will be including a lot of them in today's statistics and data points. First, let's talk about demographics. There are actually fewer millennials and Gen Zs than there were of their parents. As you can see from the graph, the average household size sharply decreased from 1960 to today, going from 3.6 people per family to only 3.1. So it's likely that the average boomer parents will be passing their wealth down to fewer than two children. Unfortunately, this means that many nonprofits will be competing over fewer donors and will likely be reliant on a smaller pool of major donors, but each will have a larger wealth and bigger giving capacity. Because of this reality, I suggest and it's not me when I'm talking. Remember, it's all the folks that we've done research with, that we've interviewed, that we've engaged with, the fundraisers, the consultants, the, the community that helps support the incredible work we do at Kila. So when I say I, I really don't want to take too much credit. It's we, you know, this data mind group of people suggest that fundraisers invest more time and resources into connecting with your existing major donor families to find areas of alignment for the future. It's important to establish these relationships before the wealth transfer actually occurs. After all, you don't wanna be an organization that doesn't have a chair to sit on when all the music stops. While there may be fewer prospects to work with in the near future, not all hope is lost. There are several studies that indicate millennials are more closely aligned with their parents, your existing major donors than ever before. 
For example, this graph shows migration rates for young people and seniors over five year periods from 2004 to 2016, with young people migrating less and less over time. This data indicates that young people are moving away from their hometowns and families less frequently than ever before. Additionally, during the COVID-19 pandemic, there was the greatest share of young people living with their parents since the Great Depression. In fact, in 2020, 52% of people aged 18 to 29 were at home with their folks. While this forced isolation may have resulted in more yelling matches than family bonding time, I think that families are actually closer than they've ever been before, especially with technology like texting, iMessage, Zoom, social media, was it Twitch, not Twitch, uh, TikTok, uh, FaceTime. I could literally go on forever about things I don't really understand. But what all of those things are, or what they mean rather, is that it's never been easier to get in contact with your family, to understand their values, to share their interests, and to, to share your lives. For fundraisers and all of us as professionals in the sector, this means that the recipients of the wealth transfer will be quite familiar with their parents' passions, but also their parents' philanthropic interests. Therefore, it is extremely important for fundraisers to make connections with the children of their major, planned, and monthly donors to establish a relationship and encourage them to continue their parents' legacy. Now, also keep in mind that baby boomers will be transferring resources to each other as boomers outlive their partners. That partner will likely become, <clears throat> excuse me, responsible for their family's assets. This is why it's crucial to make connections with the partners of your donors. Wow, I sounded really Canadian there. Establishing, the, establishing these relationships ensures that a donor's partner will share their philanthropic interest and continue to show their support for your organization. This is especially true for the wives of your major monthly and legacy donors. Why? Because I'm sorry, fellas, women generally outlive men by five years. The average life expectancy for men is 70.8 years, but for women, it's actually 75.9 years. This is one of many reasons, and there are many, and I don't want it to, to, to seem like it's just because of this. There are so many reasons why it is important to have women lead philanthropy, regardless of their age, marital status, or family situation. And in general, more families are making philanthropic decisions together. And as fundraisers, we should encourage this. This is why we're going to explore ways to engage with your donor's entire family including spouses and children, to forge a relationship and understand their collective motivation for giving. So now that we understand the numbers behind the wealth transfer, it's $58 trillion over the next 40 years. It's going to affect disproportionate amounts of millennials and Gen Zs. How exactly can we prepare for it? First, build strategies to engage more youth. Second, make connections with your donors' families, especially your major donors. And last, optimize your planned giving strategy. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the best ways to prepare for the wealth transfer is to engage young people. And I think it's important to take a step back and briefly consider the characteristics that define young donors. Now, there's not a ton of data on Gen Zs yet because they're really just coming of age. So a lot of the data that I'm going to share to you, with you, excuse me, is about millennials. Um, and a lot of it comes from a report called the Millennial Impact Report, which released its findings from a decade of research on how millennials connect, give, and involve themselves with social and political causes. Over the next couple of slides, I'd like to share some enlightening data points with you. <clears throat> Sorry. 
First, millennials are heavily influenced by their peers. And I think we have social media to blame for that one. The report, this millennial impact report, found that young people are 46% more likely to donate if a coworker does, and 65% more likely to volunteer if a coworker does. The report also found that young people don't care as much about charitable institutions. As a, as a lawyer whose now specialty is in charity law, this is interesting because the entire premise of charity law is that people give to institutions <clears throat> and those institutions play a role in our society. <clears throat> but 90% of the interviewed millennials articulated that a compelling mission or cause and not an organization was what motivated them to give. With the rise of social media activism and tools like GoFundMe and you know, these other kind of crowdfunding tools, young people are able to affect change and feel like they're affecting change without the help of nonprofits. This study found that things like charitable status and tax receipts actually don't mean much to millennials as a generation. An example of this was in the kind of late spring with the war in Ukraine and the social media movement to book Airbnbs in Ukraine. To mitigate the damages, especially financial damages of the war, proponents of the movement urged people to book Airbnbs with you know, imminent check-in dates to ensure local hosts received quick financial support and not go, obviously. Proponents made sure that people were booking not corporate Airbnbs, but individuals, and really use this as a way to provide direct quote unquote aid to the people in Ukraine who are suffering so much. And this campaign embodies a lot of what young people look for in a social issue solution. Because Airbnb waived its fees, young supporters cut out the traditional minimum and gave cash to the people that needed it. It was also a creative solution that young people engaged with publicly. They posted on social media about it. They they shared it with their friends. They felt like they were having an impact on a horrific circumstance in the world. And they did it all without any government or nonprofit or charitable institution. There's no tax receipts, nothing for these acts of philanthropy. This really aligns with that data point from that report that shows that millennials are not necessarily looking for a tax break or something tangible in return. Instead, what they're looking for is a feeling that they've made a real impact. So what can we take away from, from this? Well, I think it's crucial for nonprofits to provide young people a platform to advocate their passions and work with their peers. Most importantly, nonprofits must demonstrate how young people can most effectively be a part of a solution by working through their nonprofits platform rather than their own. <clears throat> Excuse me. To do this, nonprofit professionals and fundraisers must design opportunities specifically for young people to make to connect with them directly and make them feel empowered and a part of the change that so many organizations are creating. One example of that is a youth council. Youth councils can be a group of youth, secondary school through university age kids, or young adults, young professionals, and post-secondary grads. They're created and brought together to have their collective voice heard, excuse me, and to have a meaningful impact on their community. Engaging youth in this way is critical to preparing for the wealth transfer because young folks influence their parents' giving and are the next generation of giving. So getting them to know you and your cause when they're young and in their formative years will give them reason to support you in the future. In light of this, the two main purposes of youth councils are, one, to get young people involved in your cause so they can learn about your organization and build loyalty with you and two, engaging young people and their networks so they can help spread your organization's word about the good work you're doing, the campaigns you're running, and all the exciting ways for them to get involved. An added bonus of establishing youth councils is it's a great way to engage parents. 
So now that we all want a youth council, right? Here are a couple of best practices that we found are common and prevalent. And by the way, my wife has literally sat on youth councils helped build youth councils for organizations, and it really does work. And I say that very personally. So best practice one, establish objectives with the council. Make sure they're clear, they're written down, they're shared with the people who join, and make sure to review them annually. Two, set SMART goals. Make sure these goals are SMART. S, specific, M, measurable, A, attainable, R, relevant or realistic, and T, time-based. Next, have sign and signed annual agreements of expectations. What should meeting attendance be like? What are fundraising goals, if any? These expectations should be based on the goals and objectives of the entire groups, the one that you established a couple points ago. And there should be consequences for not fulfilling these expectations. These can include things like, if you miss X number of meetings, you're, you're asked to, to resign. If you don't hit your fundraising goal two years in a row, you're asked to resign. You know, there's these consequences don't need to be punitive, but they need to be relevant. And last, have defined aging out terms. Perhaps folks graduate from one council to the next or, you know, graduate completely from the program. Similar to youth councils, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising allows young donors to collectively affect change and feel ownership over campaigns on their own. We've all heard of peer-to-peer. -peer. It's been a buzzword in the sector probably for three or four years now. And you know, lots of technology, Kila included, provides you know peer-to-peer -peer platforms. But what's crazy is, did you know that only 14% of peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers become repeat fundraisers for future campaigns? But of those 14% of returning participants, you can actually get three times, three point five times the contributions than normal donors. So while we do a bad job of converting people from peer to peer to regular donors, those who we do effectively are incredibly valuable. By engaging with a population that is more likely to support a compelling mission, you can take the burden of asking for donations off your shoulders and putting it on to people who believe in your cause, who want to advocate it, who want to get involved, and have the power to persuade their peers. Because remember, as we saw earlier, millennials are affected by the giving of their friends and their family. Now, before you jump into your next peer-to-peer -peer campaign, please keep in mind these five best practices. First, make sure someone on your team is dedicated to overseeing your peer-to-peer -peer campaign. It does not need to be a full-time person. It does not need to be somebody who spends an inordinate amount of time it just needs to have be somebody who's responsible for setting goals and timelines and for checking in and supporting your peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Next, you need to have the right management tools. I'm not advocating for any specific one. There are lots of online platforms. Most CRMs will have them. You know, regardless of what you use, make sure you have something and make sure the data, this is really important, make sure the data from that peer-to-peer -peer platform flows into your CRM so you're enriching the, your data set because that's really important for the future. Third, just like the silent phase of a capital campaign where you secure commitments from major donors or other donors before the campaign goes public, make sure you reach out to your prospective peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers long before the campaign starts or at least before it's announced. Have them start drumming up money. Have that thermometer, which, you know, to get to the 100% of the goal, start at 30% when you're publicly announcing it. And when searching for peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers, look for young people with a history of engaging with your organization beyond merely giving. Individuals with a track record of volunteering, social media engagement, or coming to events have shown that they're willing to put in time to support you and they will make much better peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Fourth, when reaching out to your peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers, make sure to understand their goals and their values when offering them the opportunity to get involved. Once you know their passions, you can provide them with the right strategies, the right support, and the right resources to succeed because their success is ultimately your success. And most importantly, especially in the context of the wealth transfer. 
make sure to keep in touch with your young peer-to-peer -peer fundraisers following the event, following the campaign. This isn't about one and done. Consider sending them a personalized impact report that summarizes the success of their campaign and the impact they had on your organization and their community. Making a little more effort to engage your young supporters is the foundation for cultivating these donors through the great transfer of wealth. And I would bet, and I don't have a data point for this, so I apologize, that that 14% number could be significantly increased of folks who do peer-to-peer -peer or give to peer-to-peer -to -peer and become regular donors with a little bit of extra love and a little bit of stewardship post-campaign. The last way to invest in youth is my personal favorite. And I'm not supposed to have favorites, but I do. And that's focusing on monthly giving. This is crazy, folks. A study found that 60% of millennials are interested in monthly giving. 60%. I guess they, they, they do subscriptions to Netflix and to, to Spotify and to, you know, Uber Eats or whatever it might be. So this idea of monthly recurring charges is kind of part of their ethos. Well, the great thing is 60% of them think that that can be, that culture of recurring can be something that's important for giving. Even better, 45% of millennials already give online, indicating they are comfortable with virtual giving technologies that are essentially required for monthly giving. Now, of course, we all know monthly giving provides our organizations with financial stability, predictability, and which can help us budget and develop deeper and richer relationships with our donors over extended periods of time. And I think we're gonna talk a little bit later about how monthly donors actually make really great legacy donors, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. Converting one-time or multiple-time donors to recurring monthly donors is also a huge advantage for fundraisers. Even though every prospect and donor might not be able to contribute a major gift, almost anyone can contribute on a monthly basis as they can give an amount that's appropriate for them, even if it's only 10 or $20 a month. To identify monthly donors, you'll want to identify young donors who have made two or more gifts in the last six months. This is what the data shows is most likely to become a monthly donor two or more gifts in the last six months. I'll be honest, when I do this, I, may, I pull my report for the last year. If you've made two, year, two donations in the last 12 months, I'm gonna target you as to become a monthly donor. These donors are your most engaged supporters and have already demonstrated willingness to give frequently. With just a spreadsheet, it might be a little difficult to find these donors, but it'll be much easier with a filterable CRM. In your CRM or donor management tool, organize your donors by those who have given most recently and most frequency. Hot tip, I love the RFM scores that you know a lot of, at least our software can create because it really helps us to prioritize who we should be targeting for monthly giving. Additionally, if you have time to call your donors to ask them to sign up for monthly giving, prioritize millennial as they will be more giving and they're more willing to convert to, as we know, 60%, right? Now, that's not to say a phone is the only way. A targeted email appeal also works incredibly well. Similar to LAPS donors, try to personalize the email to the organization, sorry, to the parts of the organization that they are most interested in by segmenting your communication by fund or campaign or impact area. Think of these groups of people as mass targets, right? You can use email as a mechanism to get to a lot of people at once, but doing it in a slightly targeted way by this campaign or impact area or, 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 or fund will actually help them feel like it's personal and data shows is much more likely for them to convert. Last, especially for young audiences, make sure you have mobile responsive donation forms in your email appeals and on your websites. Uh, the number of donations coming on you know, via phones increases every year. Mobile visitors account for 50% of web traffic, 35% of digital transactions, and 25% of digital revenue for nonprofits. It's actually an old stat because I think the number is in the 30s now, if I remember from the most recent fundraising effectiveness project data. Now, it's impossible 
to effectively engage everyone that could be the beneficiary of the wealth transfer. And I think it's safe to assume that no organization has time to do that anyway. So it is effective, especially when you're resource crunched or more effective rather, to spend a decent amount, I would argue the majority of your time and resources engaging with family members of major donors and longtime supporters. Now, I wanna be clear, I'm not advocating for only talking about to major donors as I, you know, I told you monthly giving is my favorite opportunity, but I think it would be, we'd be remiss to not talk about monthly donors today. Now, why? Because this goes back to our 80-20 rule of fundraising. The reality is we probably should be investing 80% of our time into our top 20% of donors. For larger organizations with tens or hundreds of thousands of donors, it even could be more like five or 10 and 95 or 90 percent of time to donors. And this is not to say that small donors or monthly donors are not important, but the reality is major donors define a significant amount of our fundraising every year. And the reality is they should get special attention and even sometimes special access to your organization. Now, if you're going to give them access, why not maximize it? If you're inviting a major donor or a prospective major donor to an event, a program or site tour, or taking them out to dinner, don't forget to invite their families as well. And that's why that's relevant for this conversation. Additionally, don't forget to ask their families what their interests are and their passions are. Worst case scenario, your major donor will appreciate the hospitality. Best case, you're forging meaningful relationships that will last a lifetime and transfer to the next generation. In addition, try to actively involve the family of your, rec of your recognition in, excuse me, in your recognition and reporting activities. For example, if you send a handwritten holiday card to a major donor, send it to their entire family. A lot of major donors take pride in their family legacy. And I'm sure family members would be happy to be recognized by a nonprofit. The more we all can use we-centric language, the more whole, the whole family will feel a part of your organization. Now, before I forget and move on, major donors mean different things to different organizations. Some folks see it, see it as the top X percentage of their donors in terms of dollars. Others will say there's a minimum amount threshold. It doesn't really matter. Most of these practices and best practices really work for all of those. So regardless of how you as an organization define a major donor, think about these things in the context of that. Now, since we're going to be spending all this time with major donors and often, you know, kind of money and stewardship, make sure to let your major donor families know about the, the, your organization's opportunities for youth engagement. Don't just say thank you on a card, get that next gen engaged in your organization. Providing the children of major donors with leadership opportunities is a great way to establish multiple connections within a high net worth family or your major donors family. Last, and as always, use your common sense and fundraising instincts. I don't need to say that, but I need to say that. If the partner or the children of a major donor aren't interested, don't push hard, but you folks know that. Listen to your instinct. Use the data, let the data guide you, but listen to your instinct. While preparing for a wealth transfer is very important, you won't benefit from encouraging families to do things they don't want to do anyway. And I don't have to say that, but I want it. it's, it's a good reminder for all of us here today. Now, we've talked a lot about major donors, but what about family foundations? Let's not forget about them. You may already be connected to a philanthropic family if you have received a grant from a family foundation or through a DAF account. So to, to further develop connections within a foundation, think about investing more time or resources into connecting with the foundation or DAF's members and updating them collectively on the impact of their contributions. To help develop or strengthen connections with family foundations, I have a few best practices that could help. First, do your homework. The more you know about a family foundation and its board of directors, the more likely you'll be able to submit the type of application they're looking for. 
to, to learn as much of, as you can about the foundation, visit their website, obviously, and pay close attention to what types of programs they have funded in the past. Most foundations will also have an Our Impact section on their website where they outline their work. However, I always recommend going a little deeper. Look through their annual reports to see if and how their giving has changed over the years. You can even look through their annual financial reports, which are all public, they have to be, to understand the level of funding that different programs typically receive. Once you understand what type of program they typically fund, you can tailor the language of your application to be more in line with their giving history. For example, if they always fund programs that have an impact on youth, it will be beneficial to communicate how your program can engage and will have a positive impact on youth in your community. You can also do your homework by learning more about the board members of the foundation. This is why I get so many LinkedIn requests, but also on social, other social media channels or through mutual connections. Learn about the passions and favorite campaigns or impact areas of the foundation's board members. Now, I'm not suggesting you hire a PI to follow these people around for a week, but get to know who you're submitting to and get to know how, how they align with the values of your organization, your project, and how those can permeate through your submission. Second, heck, make a phone call to stay updated on the foundation's priorities. Foundations usually set their grant priorities for a given year or series of years. These priorities are generally based on the foundation's mission, but may vary slightly from year to year. Although foundations usually publish their yearly guidelines, calling them to double check is a good excuse to put a face to a name, well, a voice to a name, I guess, and creating awareness about your, ne your next application and your organization in general. You can even go the extra mile by in inviting them to visit <clears throat> your nonprofit sometimes. This adds a personal touch to the phone call and can make a difference down the road. Keep in mind that some foundations will explicitly say they only want to hear from nonprofits via their applications. In this case, respect their rules. It'll probably go far. Third, when you're not in the midst of a funding cycle and don't have a great opportunity to make a call, try practicing foundation stewardship, something that a lot of us don't think about. What does this look like? Well, in the same time that you would send a major donor consistent program and impact updates, you should do the same about a prospective foundation. As an entity that has already made an investment in your cause, especially if they've given a grant, they will want to know the success of their programs and by, ex ex by, ex by extent, the sex ex success, ugh, I can't speak, the success of their philanthropy. To do this, email them, phone them, get engaged with their board or publicly post a report that recaps the outcomes and impacts of their grants. Of course, don't forget to get permitted to get permission where, where appropriate and where necessary. Reminding a family foundation of the impact of your cause is a great way to develop trust between organizations and plant seeds for future giving. When applying, skip the background info. Your application shouldn't start with a phrase a long time ago in a community far, far away. Don't explain to a foundation why homelessness or climate change is a problem. They know that, it's their focus. Your goal should be to respect their knowledge and show how it can enhance it. Focus on your work rather than the problem, how you're creating solutions, how the data of your, of your programming is effective and how their money will go to work and actually cause great changes. This, these are the applications and grants that are most successful. Now, why are we talking about family foundations anyway in the context of the transfer of wealth? Well, a lot of folks, a big part of that $58 trillion is actually gonna go into family foundations for two reasons. One, because folks who've made all this money are gonna wanna make sure that there is an important and carved out part for philanthropy, not just now, but for years to come. And two, because it's tax efficient. And let's not pretend that doesn't matter for a lot of folks. While much of the wealth transfer will be passed down generationally, it's important for fundraisers like all of you to have the resources, strategies, and technology to develop the last thing I'm gonna talk about today, planned giving infrastructure. In fact, $6.3 trillion of the wealth transfer 
is projected to reach charities as bequests. Planned giving is typically at the top of the donor pyramid. It is, among, it is amongst the most profound and financially impactful forms of giving. So planned donor prospects deserve a high touch approach that motivates them to leave your organization in their will. However, you can't use a high touch approach for every donor in your database. You need to prioritize your prospects based on a variety of factors. And we've dug a little bit, we're gonna share some data about the five main indicators that you could look for when thinking about a planned giving prospect. First, and most importantly, is donor loyalty. 50% plus of legacy donors give to their organization for more than 20 years before leaving behind a planned gift. 20 years. So when segmenting your planned giving prospects, start with those who have given to your organization for at least 10 years, because you know they've got loyalty, they care deeply about the work, and they feel committed to it continuously over and over and over again. Next, the age of the prospect, not surprisingly, is crucial for prioritizing planned giving. Donors age 44 and older represent more than 75% of all wills and more than 80% of the total value of all charitable bequests made. So filter for folks about 40 who probably have started making a will or are thinking about it because that's a great place to start. With all due respect to all the millennials and the Gen Zs, almost all of them probably don't have a will. So asking them about it seems like a waste of time. Plus it's probably unlikely they've been given to your organization for 10 or 20 years anyway. Third is parental status. As a parent, I guess as a new parent, two and a half years, kids are expensive. And the Planned Giving Research Grant Program found that 50% of donors age 50 and over with no children had charitable estate plans. 50% of people over the age of 50 with no kids plan to give to charity in their will. Among similar donors, age 50 and above, with children, only 17% had philanthropic plans. We all love kids, but they are expensive. So consider prioritizing donors without children as they may have more assets or wealth to dedicate to purpose-driven organizations in their will. Similar to parental status, marital status affects planned giving. Planned gifts from single, never married donors are about 13% larger than married donors. So pay extra attention to those folks, if, of course, you have that data. Last, and definitely the strangest that I'm going to share with you today, is pet ownership. Yes, you heard me right, pet ownership. Although this is rather peculiar, there has been some very interesting research by uh, Free will, which does a lot of um, wills in the US, that suggests pet owners are about 70% more likely to give, 70% more. In addition, while pet owners only write 25% of all wills, 70% of these wills include a charitable bequest. And this is data from free will. Keep in mind though, that just because someone has children, is married or doesn't have a pet, doesn't necessarily mean they aren't a good planned giving prospect. These are mainly indicators to help you prioritize your work. Combine these factors with your fundraising instincts, and this will lead to the most favorable results and the highest conversion rates and the most effective use of your time. When you're working on planned giving appeals, here are a few quick best practices to think about. First, Make sure you have a CRM or a database that allows you to segment your donors based on the indicators I mentioned above and a lot of other indicators that your instincts or your fundraising knowledge will tell you. This will allow you to, sorry, by filtering rather, this will allow you to create a list of the best prospects to outreach your organization. And I think this kind of stems to everything. It'll give you the most likely for monthly. It'll give you the most likely you know, to be involved in a peer-to-peer -peer campaign. Being able to slice and dice and segment your list is so important, especially for those of us who have larger donor databases and don't want to get lost in wasting our time. Next, back to planned giving, sharing resources about the intricacies of planned giving 
is a great way to encourage legacy gifts. Many donors don't know that there are a variety of ways to organize charitable bequests. For example, nonprofits can be left as the beneficiary of a life insurance policy. Sharing giving alternatives like this is a great way to get your donors thinking about their future. There are lots of websites online that can give you resources and educate you about how you can share planned giving opportunities with your donors. Third, you don't need to mention death specifically to, or hint at it by asking them to leave a legacy. We found from, we, I did an interview of a fundraising consultant who talked a lot about creating legacy or making a long-term gift where you're saying the same thing, but using words that are, you know, less morose. Most importantly, ensure you've established a meaningful philanthropic relationship before you ask for a planned gift. You shouldn't be asking people to leave you in the will early in your fundraising relationship. This is why your monthly donors make great giving prospects for planned giving, excuse me. Many monthly donors give to an organization for years, even decades, and have constantly received a stream of steady communications and stewardship. The longevity of their relationship with the organization is the fundamental basis for a planned gift. Before I answer a couple of questions and we go on our merry ways, I wanna recap a couple of the takeaways from my presentation. If you'll remember way back to the start of this presentation, I talked about this thing called the great transfer of wealth that will be characterized by $58 trillion transfer from one generation to the next. And there will be three beneficiaries of this transfer, the heirs of baby boomers and mainly millennials and Gen Zs, nonprofits, that's all of you folks, especially those as part of family foundations and charitable bequests, and the government. To prepare for the transfer, today we've talked about three key strategies. First, to engage the next generation through youth councils and peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Next, to build strong communications with major donor families. And last, to prepare for the wealth transfer by investing in planned giving. Well, folks, you've heard me talk for far too long. I hope I've been helpful today. And I know the wonderful Kim has got some questions lined up, so I will happily defer to her on the floor. But before I do, I wanted to say thank you all for listening. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time. And I commend you in, you know, during this fundraising season, spending a few minutes to think and learn and grow your fundraising knowledge. And I'm sure all the organizations we work with will benefit from it. Kim? Thanks, Najid. Um, Sorry, I don't know what's happening with my uh, screen right now. I'm going to try and figure out the camera while I start on these questions, but we had a lot of questions come in. So I want to get started on those. Um, first question that came in, do you think that younger generations will care more about tax receipts when they are holding more wealth or encountering more tax liability? I, I'm a lawyer, so I'm the wrong person to ask, I think, on this, but my instinct says absolutely. I think, especially as folks in the tech sector, for example, who have, you know, not, they have bigger exits and they, they make more money, you know, they have bigger sums of money coming in at once and they're going to have these giant tax liabilities when they inherit money and they don't want to pay estate taxes. When they start thinking about that, my instinct is to say, yes, they are going to care about it. I don't think this spells the end of the institution. I don't think it spells the end of structural nonprofits and charitables, charitable organizations. I think that what we've seen is organizations can do a better job of engaging and inspiring people and showing direct impact. And when they come into more money or when they earn more money, I think absolutely they're going to want to do that. But I think combining that with that engagement piece is going to further cement the importance of our institutions as institutions uh, in our sector. But the short answer is absolutely. But again, because I'm a lawyer, I'm a little bit biased towards institutions. It's okay. I think we're here for your biases. We want to hear them. <laughs> uh, second question. Can you share any sample objectives or goals for youth council in terms of best practices and establishing objectives? 
Absolutely. And, I, and I'm, you know, I'd love to give a talk just on youth councils and maybe bring a few other folks who have built them. I know a couple organizations um, that I've worked with or my family's worked with, my wife. Um, so I would love to do that. But a couple of things is um, objective one is like, is it a fundraising organization? Is the core purpose of fundraising? Yes or no. It's a really important thing to think about. Is it for volunteering? Is it, um, is there going to be, uh, is the goal to get a youth, um, for example, a youth perspective on outreach and fundraising and communications, or is it a goal to get a youth perspective on the actual programming that's being done? Um, is this just a way to get to major donors? If so, you don't have to say it like that, but make sure internally you understand that that's the purpose. Um, is, um, is this a pipeline for future staff members? Uh, and I said volunteers, kind of like, so So that's something to think about. These are the kinds of objectives that we can all think about when building our youth council. Awesome. Um, next question. Can you recommend ways to minimize service charges that are eating into monthly donations? Well, and now I'm going to share my bias as the CEO of a company that builds technology for the sector. We don't take anything apart from credit card fees. So I would make sure that your donor management platform, your fundraising platform is allowed two things. One, not charging you an extra percentage. Credit card companies are credit card companies. There's not a lot we can do, but one, make sure that you're not being dinged with one, two, three, four, five extra percent. Some, some platforms are charging up to five or 6%. Two, encourage, um, ACH or bank transfer donation. Um, I know Kila Pay, for example, has ACH and that can, for larger, for larger donations, that can really make a material difference. And three, make sure, this is the most important one, make sure you have a checkbox on the form that allows your donors and your monthly donors to come cover the month, co cover the processing fees. It's some absurd number, like 65%. Don't quote me on that one because I'm going off memory. We'll check that box and on Kilo's forms, you can actually default check it, I think, too. And so, you know, little things like that, those three things are going to help you let those $10 donations really feel like $10 donations. That was a great answer. Thanks, Sajid. Um, next question. I record gifts from family foundations as part of the individual's record. Do you recommend making a separate record for family foundations or maybe just tagging these individuals as family foundation givers? And what about family funds that may be part of the community fund? Should these be looked at the same way as family foundations? Great question. And actually, I was on a webinar last week with somebody, and I got super excited about soft credits because this is the best example of soft credits. Um, so I, again, lawyer brain is going to say, have every donor who's a legal entity, whether it's a company, a family foundation, which is its own legal entity or individual, make the donation come from them. It makes your reporting, it makes your slicing and dicing really, really clean. But it, soft credits are such an incredible opportunity to show the value of a donor beyond the legal person. You know, in Canada and the US, a person, which is really weird, is defined as both a human and an entity. So the donor as a person is often not done in isolation. It might come from a family foundation, which really has another donor or from peer to peer, you know, it might come through that fundraiser. So creating soft credits and having your organization really understand the value of donors um, beyond just their individual gifts through soft credits is super valuable. And to me, the Family Foundation is the best example of that. Also, I love soft credits and I could talk about it for hours on end and Kim would cut me off. So, Kim. No worries. We'll give a shout out to Susan for giving Najid his favorite question <laughs> of the day. <laughs> Um, how would a new nonprofit find the people to perform the fundraising or grant writing as a volunteer? Ooh, big question. Um, I think, you know, without spending six hours on this topic, what I'll say is like, start with what you know. Start with the people in your community, your network. Start with the folks that are um, um, most engaged in the topic. No nonprofit is started almost no nonprofits is started on an island, you know, in isolation. So think about that when, when you're looking for your first set of volunteers. Um, you know, I think historically speaking, grants are more often given to folks who have a little bit more established impact. 
So maybe start with individual fundraising so that you can get some programming out the door, show your impact, and um, and uh, and then move on to grants. Um, someone asked just about soft credits, um, and I'll just answer that specifically and say a soft credit is showing somebody who's connected to a donation without actually being the donor. So for example, if Kim makes a donation because I, as a Najid is her coworker or her family member or whatever it is, giving somebody a soft credit is sort of tagging them as like, think about it like the assist in basketball, right? It's the person or the institution who supported that donation. And it lets you really understand the value that in this case I bring because I brought Kim along. And while I didn't make the donation, Kim, Kim made the $100 donation legally, the receipt is issued to Kim. You're kind of tagging me for that five, 100 bucks or whatever I said, because it shows that I brought them along. If Kim has a family foundation, Kim isn't the actual legal donor. She's not giving the $10,000 gift. Her family foundation is, but she might be the real reason. So creating that connection and that kind of web or network, the value of Kim is more than just her existing donations. It's also the stuff she can bring or that she's connected to. Great, great question, Kurt. Um, I know we're close on time. I'm just going to ask the last question that came in here from Tina. We are in our third year of ongoing DEI training. One of our top three goals is to accomplish this next year is to start a youth council. So she's excited to hear you talk about it. Do you know of any nonprofits who also do this? Or who's, yes, but I haven't got their permission wow. to use their names yet. So um, what I'm going to try to do is... Um, Bug me, Bug, Kim can share. I think I can give my public email here. Uh, Nishid.kasam at keela.com. If you can't figure that out, then I don't, hold on. How do I, what I can, everyone, here we go. All right, I've popped my email in there. Bug me about that. I will have someone on my staff reach out to an organization that I know has done it incredibly well and um, happy to then um, connect you if you have questions. And look at that. Carolyn has said the, App Appalachian Trail Conservancy has a great youth council. So there we go. All right, great. I know we're on time now and that's all the questions we have. Aretha, um, I will pass it back to you to say the final goodbye. This was so awesome. I was sitting here taking notes, even though I can watch it again. It's really, really good. Thank you so very much.